At this point, you've probably already noticed that Jennifer's body is going through a renaissance. Everyone is either reacting to it or talking about it in some way. And the consensus has been made that it is a cult classic feminist horror and one of the most iconic movies ever made. Why then, when it came out over 10 years ago, it was a box office and critical failure? Why did the 2009 audience fail to see its greatness? In my opinion, this all has to do not only with how the film was marketed, but also with the way it subverts conventional horror troops and turns the male gaze against itself. Welcome to the feminist horror of Jennifer's Body. Before we begin, please don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you like movies, video games, books and that kind of stuff. Help me grow this community where we all love movies and are depressed. Oh, and spoilers ahead. The male gaze is one of the key concepts of film and gender studies. In 1975, Laura Mulvey introduced this idea in her essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, where she used psychoanalysis to argue that traditional Hollywood movies suffer from scopophilia, the sexual pleasure of looking, and that movies are filmed in a way that satisfies heterosexual male scopophilia. Basically, all this means that women appear in movies to be looked at by the men, both the man inside the film and the man watching the film. And, fortunately, only for the theme of this video, there is no better example for the male gaze than the image of Megan Fox herself. I had just turned 15 and I was an extra in Bad Boys 2. Really? And Yeah, they were shooting this club scene. And they brought me in, and uh, I was wearing a Stars and Stripes bikini and a red cowboy hat and, like, six-inch heels. And uh, he approved it, and they said, you know, Michael, <laughs> um, she's 15, so you can't sit her at the bar, and she can't have a drink in her hand. So his solution to that problem was to then have me dancing underneath the waterfall getting soaking wet. And that's... Perfectly wholesome? At 15, I was in 10th grade. So that's, <laughs> that's sort of a microcosm of how Bay's mind works. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, that's really a microcosm of how all our minds work. It was the year 2007 when the first Transformers movie came out and it turned out to be a massive success, shooting Mega Fox to the center of the spotlight, earning her the title of sex symbol and the most beautiful woman on Earth. Her character, Michaela Baines, in the Transformers franchise was portrayed as an object. It didn't matter how well-written or well-developed she was. The eye of the camera focused on her body through the eyes of the young and goofy male protagonist, Sam Witwicky, that serves as the stand-in of this movie's demographic. And so it was sealed. The image of Megan Fox transformed into that of an object of desire, made to be looked at by a male audience for their pleasure. Men thought they owned Megan Fox, to the point that in 2009, male-centered websites and magazines declared the 4th of August the day without Megan Fox. Megan Fox is banging. Yes, Megan Fox is delicious. Yes, Megan Fox farts rainbows. But seriously, enough is enough. <sighs> in conclusion, men thought Megan Fox existed for them to look at. Quoting Mulvey, Women are characterized by their to be looked atness in cinema. Woman is a spectacle and man is the bearer of the look. The horror genre has a particular relationship with the male gaze. Horror films are told as stories of good versus evil, and the drama of their narratives consists in the clash between a monster and an innocent. In this sense, women become this innocent being for whom the audience can be afraid of. Take for instance the death of Maria in 1931's Frankenstein, and then the scene where the monster attacks Elizabeth. The first two people the monster kills are actually men, but it is until the two women are endangered that the plot deems the monster beyond salvation and the angry mob chases him. Women are supposed to be innocent in horror and they are punished if they're not. 
Take for instance the victims of Michael Myers in the original Halloween. He kills three women that don't repress their sexualities, beginning with his sister after he sees her naked after an encounter with her boyfriend. Then kills Nancy when he sees her walking around her house naked and finally she kills Linda after she has sex with her boyfriend. All of this means that not only the audience watches first these women's bodies in a lustful manner through the eyes of a male monster, but also watches them being massacred, which is relevant for horror since it relies on the physical human form and hostility towards the body to carry its plots and storylines in the most extreme sense. You can argue that in the case of Halloween, Michael also kills the boyfriend, so it is not only presenting women as weak, but in fact, the boyfriend's death is only a device to remove protection from the now vulnerable female. That is why in most horror films, men are either separated from the female or killed off first. One of the characteristics of the male gaze is that it usually represents women for what the male needs from them. Here, the movie requires these girls being killed to get to the final act when Laurie is chased by Michael, but she is deemed defenseless by the movie and has to be saved by Dr. Loomis, a man that does nothing throughout the whole film and only fulfills the role of man savior. It doesn't matter that the protagonist is a woman and that the monster killed her best friends, she has to be saved by the dude. Laurie is probably the most popular example of the trope of the final girl, if not one of the characters who defined the trope of the final girl. Also called the virgin, she usually is represented as a traditionally feminine woman who has to run for her life in the final act of the film. The virgin's death is optional as long as it's last. Main thing is that she, you know, suffers. She is the one the audience fears for, the one that does not deserve what's happening to her and needs to be taken care of due to her innocence. And it is most probable that she is the only one that is not objectified by the camera. In this sense, horror excludes women. This is not to say that women can't enjoy horror, that is not at all the case, but I do believe that there is a sort of desensitization, I hope I said that correctly, towards screen violence and disassociation of gender when watching a horror flick. In other words, when watching a horror movie, women have to distance themselves from their femininity in order to participate in the cinematic experience. Women have to learn to look through the male gaze. Enter Jennifer's body. It is clear now then that both Megan Fox's image and the representation of women in the horror genre are highly filtered through the male gaze. So when Jennifer's body came out, a horror movie is stirring none other than Megan Fox as a sexy cheerleader who feeds on boys. The marketing team of Jennifer's Body didn't think it twice to target it to men. In the words of Oscar-winning screenwriter Diablo Cody, The studio had a very strong, unshakable belief that this movie needed to be marketed to young men, specifically. So that was who they... Which came because of me, I'm assuming. Yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, I got a very memorable email from, <laughs> from a, um, a marketing person at the studio once. Mm -hmm. Right. I, you know, had sent him this articulate defense of the film and here's how it should be marketed. And I, I said, what specifically are you thinking? And he wrote back, Megan Fox hot, three words, in terms of what is the value of this film. What makes Jennifer's body a great piece of feminist horror is that it is actively subverting all the conventions I've talked about so far. It invalidates the virgin trope since Instead of representing virginity as a plot armor, Jennifer is killed in the beginning because the band thinks she is precisely a virgin. I'm not even a backdoor virgin. You could still argue that in the end, she dies first, perpetrating the first girl trope. Also referred to as the whore, it consists in killing first the sexually active, usually blonde girl, because she is supposed to be corrupted. But it is because Jennifer was not pure and innocent that she survived the sacrifice and was empowered by it. The same thing applies to Needy. She is the heroine and she comes across as more innocent than Jennifer. 
but she is not a virgin either by the end of the movie. The director is also taking away the erotic way in which heterosexual sex is shown in the horror genre, where women are always the objects of desire. Okay, baby, let's see some boobies. Show us the goods. Does it really matter if we see We're it? not the only ones watching, Ken. Gotta keep the customer satisfied. Instead, in Jennifer's body, the scene between Cheap and Needy is goofy and awkward and the female body is shown in a terrifying light. In fact, the more steamy scene of the film is between Jennifer and Needy. Rather than appealing to heterosexual male scopophilia, it is charged with meaning. Take for instance this scene in Mac G's The Babysitter. The audience is not familiar with Bella Thorne's character and there isn't actually a close relationship between her and B. So, the presence of this sequence is completely gratuitous and filtered through the reactions of the male characters because it is done for the consumption of a male audience. But here, the whole film focuses on the relationship between the female characters and the kissing scene does more than being there. It carries the theme of the almost symbiotic nature of their friendship directly stating for the first time in the film that both have romantic feelings for each other. Feelings they can't really make sense of, but by being inseparable best friends. Not only that, but after watching Jennifer seducing and killing boys, it shows that only with Needy she allows herself to be vulnerable and loved. After all, it is after this scene that she opens up to her friend about what happened the night of the fire. To me, this also shows how truly intimate they are, in contrast to their relationships with the men in the movie. Just look at the differences between this scene and the one between Chip and Needy. On the one hand, you have extreme close-ups which emphasize that sense of intimacy and closeness. On the other, you have awkwardness and horror. That's what makes the death of Jennifer in the end much more meaningful. She fights Needy until she breaks her best friend's forever necklace. Seeing the symbol of their love gone is what really hurts Jennifer, because it means that she has lost the most meaningful relationship she had in her life. There is no man savior to save the day and kill the monster. Why the opposite actually? Women and their experiences are the core of the film. Jennifer's victims don't even have value by themselves. The first guy she kills is the typical popular jock which means that once he's dead, there won't be anyone to threaten her social status. The other two victims she chooses only because of their close relationship with Needy, as if by killing them she could have her or simply to take them out of the way. Here, the male characters are represented by what the female needs from them. All that is seen is done so from a female perspective thus subverting the male gaze. The literal Jennifer's body, which means Megan Fox's body, is a threat to boys rather than a commodity. Uh, any other time I'd be happy to see that, but now I'm just alarmed. The woman stops being the victim and becomes the predator. Men are not heroes, but goofy and pathetic horny boys, much like those who came to the theater thinking they were going to see a typical horror movie with Megan Fox in it. Um, so there was there was a test screening that a kid wrote. They said, what would you improve about this film? And the kid wrote, needs more boobs and spelled um, boobs B-E-W-B-S. Why then women have to unsex themselves to watch movies like Halloween, but heterosexual cis men can't do the same with Jennifer's body? One of my favorite readings of this film is the one Megan Fox herself gives it. As I realized that in filming that scene where they sacrifice me, um, that for me, that was really reflective of, I felt like my relationship with the movie studios at that point, um, because I felt like that's what they were willing to do to literally bleed me dry. They didn't care about my health, my well-being, mentally, emotionally, physically at all. And they were willing to sacrifice me physically as long as they got what they wanted out of it. It shows that this movie speaks to women in one way or another. 
and that is because of the genius of Diablo Cody and Karin Kusama. Jennifer's body subverts the final girl trope by not presenting sexuality as something to be condemned, but as a source of empowerment. It turns the male gaze against itself, since it shows the female body as a threatening element and not a simple passive thing to be observed. That is why 13-year-olds and frat boys didn't connect with it back in 2009. This is a movie about women, for women of all sexualities. Fortunately, in a post Me Too and Time's Up era, it finally found its audience, and it is being appreciated as it should have always been. Now, regarded as a feminist cult classic, it's confirmed that Jennifer's Body was a movie ahead of its time. Hey there, if you got this far into the video, thank you. I really appreciate it. This is my first attempt at making a video essay. I hope I was able to make my points clear and if you liked it and want to see more content of this kind, please leave a like and subscribe. If you want to dig deeper into some of the things I said in this video, I'll leave some articles and videos in the description box. Share your thoughts on Jennifer's body with me in the comments down below. Remember that you can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram too. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.